um, land restoration ecologists that working mostly in the in the Calumet region uh, of Southeast Chicago and Northwest Indiana, and I'll show you some maps uh, coming up. Don't worry. I just want to get going. Otherwise, we're going to be here for for quite a while. Uh, and I think I, I'm more the, the kind of guy that say uh, Susan Roof of the Nature Conservancy will send to the field to get people connected, uh, talk about these issues, uh, find ways to partner around. Uh, whether natural areas, whether degraded areas that can be brought back to some kind of a natural state, uh, issues that deal with remediation that eventually could be combined with an ecological reuse of these areas as well. And valuation, whether we like it or not, at least working in the United States and working in the Calumet region, money is an issue. And so it's part of the culture perhaps the reverse from, from Ecuador or some, other, some of the other areas that you talked about. So uh, it, it will make for a good discussion later. Um, but what I do mostly is really assemble this, this land conservation partnerships, land restoration, and remediation partnerships between, mainly between industries and communities. And um, is it coming up? Yeah, sorry, Takes a little time. Oh, oh, don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry, it's happened before. Um, and what, what I found from doing this work and now in the Calumet region for about 12 some years is that uh, some of the things that connect people is that their value, their perception of the value of their local natural areas. They do, people do value uh, their ecosystems, whether you call them uh, a pocket park, uh, an open space, a larger park, uh, shoreline access, um, urban canopy, a, a, a small migratory stopover for shorebirds. Uh, people do value their ecosystems. And the other uh, benefit or the other understanding that it's this kind of work has uh, brought about to me is that I really understand or know about who has to supply who has the supply of these ecosystem services, and I know who also has demand. And it's not always an industry uh, with the interest for demand. It's all, it could be municipalities, it could be a developer, uh, so on, it could be a community in itself. So uh, I will talk about those shortly. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost there. Yeah. And I really made Savina suffer. I gave her the, the copy of my presentation like at midnight, Sorry. last minute. Um, just to fill the space. I also have to say that I have this uh, huge um, sinus headache. It's driving me crazy. And whomever made up that comment about breaking the windows, the glass, that metaphor earlier this morning, uh, it was a torture. I don't know who that was. but. Um, I'm going to get that guy. <laughs> um, oh, don't worry. I think uh, m my goals for the presentation are really to give you a very quick background to uh, the, the organization that I work for, uh, the Wildlife Habitat Council, and then go into uh, background on the Calumet region and the conservation context within that region, and very also hopefully very quickly touch, thanks, Tavina. Um, touch bases on uh, regulatory context and planning context that either encourages or discourages uh, building ecosystem services and eventually this, what, I, what I will hope will be markets. And finally, what I wanna do is, um, I wanna ask the question of how, I'm not gonna answer the question, uh, but I will ask the question of how land conservation and restoration initiatives, especially in this very urban uh, industrial area, can become markets for, for ecosystem services. Um, a quick background to the Wildlife Habitat Council. It's an NGO, 20 years old now, and uh, we mainly work with industry. We focus on restoration, uh, wildlife habitats, uh, organizing uh, employees or employees coming to us and 
uh, offering their vision for the restoration of habitats or uh, landscapes within their own properties. And as you can imagine, many companies, industries have tons of land. And in the past, they considered these as buffer lands, but now they are completely reconsidering their value in terms of the biodiversity, climate change, water, you name it. Uh, we also offer programs, we call them the Wildlife at Work and the Corporate Lands for Learning. Corporate Lands for Learning is really bringing kids from their local public schools to use industrial lands uh, as, a learning, as a learning place. And we provide technical support in ecological sciences, third party certification, accreditation. And if you have time or if you come from the East Coast, uh, in a couple of weeks, we also offer uh, ecosystem services on corporate land, so our focus will be on private corporate lands in that conference. And we provide awards, recognitions, uh, big party at, at, in November and, uh, for, for those guys and gals that do all this kind of work um, uh, on their facilities and plans. Quick picture of the, I don't know, from far away, I think it's gonna look very blurry, but um, uh, let's see, just a sense of what the, it's about, uh, this is the Calumet region, although it's more, the Calumet region is more of a mental map than real exact map that you can find anywhere, but it, it stretches from the southern suburbs of, of uh, Chicago, including southeast neighborhoods of Chicago, at about Western uh, 57th Avenue, all the way about 45, 47 miles, maybe a little more, to uh, Michigan City, Indiana. And to the south about includes the floodplain of the Little Calumet River. Uh, Grand Calumet River about here. Uh, Lake Calumet, Chicago, I think somewhere there. It's all, though it's very blurry. And uh, University of Chicago, somewhere there. And um, together with, with, the, with Chicago neighborhoods, uh, together the, meaning the three counties of Northwest Indiana and the Chicago neighborhood, neighborhoods make up a very ecologically or an ecologically distinct area. It's a very urban industrial land used uh, uh, with fragmented natural areas of high uh, biological diversity. And it's also a culturally rich and a very diverse population that lives here. And I, I, like I said before, it's a population that really values the, their ecosystem services, what they have in terms of their important natural resources, uh, difficult to see again in these maps, and the many parks, recreations, and open spaces that you can find throughout the region. Uh, on the Illinois side, you know, if you go back, oh gosh. Oh, there you go. Uh, the, the Chicago, Illinois side is about this much, and then the rest is Indiana. So my presentation is very Indiana or Hoosier centric. And, but starting with the Chicago area, as you can tell, this is a map for, uh, put together from the Field Museum and the, Chic uh, the Calumet Stewardship Initiative, which is one of, one of those great partnerships between the city of Chicago, um, many groups, uh, my mind escapes it, uh, including Hoosier groups, Indiana groups, and uh, Friends of the Park, uh, Friends of the River, um, you name it. I mean, just a great, great aggregate of uh, very diverse, uh, culturally, uh, artistic, and also environmental groups that are uh, engaged, uh, especially spearheaded by the city of Chicago in restoring uh, many of these areas that you find in green and blue. Uh, one very nice example, and I'm um, plugging in for uh, City of Chicago, Nicole Cummins, and you can come to her later. Uh, but she has a great presentation on what it's going to be in this area called the Hegwich Marsh, uh, the new Fort Calumet uh, Nature Center. And that will be the second nature center in the City of Chicago. So we're all very excited. I know it's taking a little bit. But it's, it's coming, but uh, when, you, when you look at the fragments, many of this area, if not most of these areas, um, have the, their, uh, their ecological qualities perhaps not the best. You know, there are, some of them are degraded, some of them have been impacted by slag, uh, years of industrial use, and so uh, it's a long-term process. Before we move to, to the 
to the Indiana side and what the conservation um, context is for, for Indiana, I want you to memorize these questions. Uh, basically, uh, what I want you to do is to think about, well, you know, when you take in, into account that this is such a fragmented landscape, uh, how could these areas become future locations or future market locations for the many of the uh, market opportunities and ideas that have been um, uh, put forward today? Uh, some of those that uh, were spoke about were biodiversity offsets and conservation banking. Are there opportunities on those? Uh, compensatory mitigation wetlands. Can degraded areas become uh, wetland mitigation banks? And of course, that would be very expensive, but uh, we need more wetlands. Uh, carbon storage, uh, flood, flood mitigation in terms of the watershed protections. We've had perhaps the, the, the wettest year in history. Uh, I think in Indiana, on the Indiana side, we even, I, I'm exaggerating, we probably had two 100-year events and one 500-year events or something like that within a several months. Or, I mean, it was outrageous. And so you could imagine how many neighborhoods and communities were flooded. And so how do we rebuild uh, areas where flood control can take place? Can these fragmented areas, can these, how can we connect them and make, make it all happen? And also, who, who should pay for this? And who should get paid for, for their services, for the services that they can offer, you know, for the lands that they can offer? On, continuing on the Indiana side, on the Indiana side we have uh, uh, a great asset, which is the, uh, especially very contiguous and together asset, which is the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, which is about 14,000 acres, but many, many remnant beaches, marshes, moraines, uh, slow moving rivers, the little, the little Calumet and the Grand Calumet rivers are considered slow moving, uh, if at all. And the area also is a convergence of uh, three biomes, probably four, including the boreal remnants. So you have uh, in, in the Northwest Indiana area and some parts of Chicago too, but especially in Northwest Indiana, you have uh, ecological remnants from boreal forests and uh, tall grass prairies and nor uh, Northeastern hardwoods and even some of the Southern species uh, make, it, make it that way. And also, also a very uh, way, uh, specific way that you see from the for, from an aerial picture is that you have many of the ridges left over, not many, but few ridges left over uh, of what are called uh, dunan swells, and I'll show you some pictures about those. Um, just in a small area, if not far from Chicago, not far from Chicago, um, this is the Gary Airport here, and the uh, city of Chicago is not far, but this is the city of East Chicago, parts of Hammond, and get, when you get into Gary, and this is the Grand Calumet River, uh, you have these ridges, these fragments of ridges left over um, from the uh, um, drying up of the, of the lake, basically, and dune building over uh, at least 4,500, 5,000 years old. And uh, these are areas, uh, what we call dune and swells, that are really high in biodiversity. And you can, you can see by the kind of work that the Nature Conservancy is doing, in specifically focusing this area, uh, but there is other entities doing great work, restoration work, especially including the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, the Indiana DNR, the Heinz Land Trust, and uh, the county uh, entities as well. The, the, in terms of building markets, in terms of well, in terms of just getting the work done so we can have these services after restoration or during the restoration, is the difficult, complicated ecological reuse and, and res the complicated regulatory planning, and sometimes even the conservation context is also complex. I mean, you also have not, not just one type of ecosystems and many types of ecosystems in the one s small areas, but when you talk about regulatory and planning context, it, it's really um, uh, monetize or given uh, financial value to the resources that have been impacted in the past, and those are the NRDS. Uh, and also another very important element in terms of inter understanding how this land reuse could be turned into a more uh, ecological reuse is looking at the Chicago Ecotox 
protocol which covers about 12,000 acres and that also gives you a baseline of where you may start, what type of land you have, based on what type of land you have, what type of restoration, what type of services that property uh, may, may provide in the future. Uh, not all discouraging, but encouraging are the public and private partnerships that sustain this very long term, what I think is a very long term, and also very labor intensive uh, work on the ground, uh, managing and restoring uh, many sites. And there's great examples, um, even though it feels, some days it feels like you're doing work in the, in the Balkans, in the former Yugoslavian, uh, it's, it's just that difficult, but you know, there's some really good, um, good examples of, of partnerships. Quickly going through what some of the regulatory context that would encourage or discourage uh, assembling uh, ecosystem markets uh, in this area are the famous or infamous R Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, uh, major, major uh, facilities, industrial facilities in these areas which pretty much cover about almost half of the of the shoreline available to the state of Indiana, uh, whether they want it or not, they, you know, and I think that some of the companies would like to turn some of this shoreline to the public, uh, they cannot do so. They cannot turn these areas into ecological areas because the regulatory context uh, makes it so difficult. Uh, and RECRA, I'll talk more if you guys have uh, questions about that. Uh, on the other hand, Superfund sites uh, are really, Somehow the law applies, you know, it works differently, but there's a lot of interest and a lot of movement in terms of ecological reuse of Superfund sites. So whether you could say uh, Superfund sites are bring, bringing back ecosystem services uh, like they did uh, hundreds of years ago, uh, you know, we, we can discuss that, but I think the, the ball is moving. And other examples, planning context, many plans that either uh, encourage or discourage the, the, these issues. Um, and I, I'm going to leave it at that because my, qu my time is up, but um, can I buy some time from the, from the minutes that I lost? No. Um, so how, how do we use these ecological restoration movements and initiatives and partnerships and move them in, in, into an ecosystem market? Whether that is a good idea or not, uh, I think it is. I can explain more later, but um, uh, because I think that conservation, ecosystem and habitats can be a unifying issue. People relate to that. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions, misperceptions of each other's uh, land use role, uh, whether it's community versus industry versus agencies uh, against conservation versus land trust and so on. But these things are are blurring, the lines are blurring, and that's encouraging. And um, ways of building trust, using, can we use the market to build a trust between these organizations, these entities, uh, and how would that, in order to increase ecosystem services, increase ecological restoration, and how, how could we do that? Should we include more management and monitoring activities in their uh, contracts and agreements? Uh, should we include more conservation education? Be part of a market transaction to have conservation education? Uh, what about research dissemination so the information becomes public? Thanks. <laughs>